I'm going to start out a little differently this morning. I want to start out with a question. What do you fear? What do you fear? How many of you are afraid of snakes? It's a good thing we're Methodist. How many of you are afraid of spiders? A mouse or a rat? How many of you are afraid of heights? I'm afraid of heights. I will admit that. I'm six foot two, but I'm afraid of heights. We had moved into the parsonage in Oxford, North Carolina when I was the student pastor. We had cable TV, but up on the roof were still the remnants of an antenna from the days gone past. Now, some of you guys don't know what an TV antenna is, do you? It's this thing that you hung up on the roof at metal and it pointed different ways and it picked up signals. See, some of y'all didn't live the good life. Anyway, that was still up there and we had a storm come through and it sort of bent it over and it bent it over where it was about to fall on our cars but more importantly on the, in, the door we went in and out of because we went in and, out, in and out of the side door, not the front door. And so I knew I needed to get up on the roof to do that so I went over to my neighbor Billy's house and borrowed his ladder. I put the ladder up against the, the, the uh, wall of the house and the roof and went up and was able to secure that and get it fixed the, the antenna the way I needed to get it fixed. And then came the moment when my fear of heights kicked in. It's that moment when you have to come back down the, la the, the roof and turn and put your foot on the ladder to come back down. That's always been a moment of trepidation. I can climb a ladder and I'm okay as long as I stay on the ladder. But if I put myself up on the roof or all in a different situation and I have to get back on that ladder, I'm a little clumsy. And so I don't want to take the fast lane coming down the ladder. <laughs> so I did it. I tried to do it, rather. And I sit there and I went back up and sat for a few moments and thought, well, what am I going to do? I'm up here on the, the ladder. And I was talking to God and all of a sudden it thundered. And God, and, and I had the motivation, I better get off the roof. So I was able, thank God, to climb down and take the ladder back to Billy's house and go in the house and breathe again. We all find ourselves facing fears in life, don't we? And sometimes our fears are heightened. Like when we hear about flooding in Houston and we wonder, could that happen here? Now, I'll be honest with you. If we got as much rain as they did, we'd probably be flooded right here. Because down there are always floods across the field. We hear the opioid e epidemic and the associated crimes related to that. We fear growing old and being left alone. We fear debilitating diseases will strike us or, or perhaps strike someone we love. We fear running out of money, and some of us know what that means every month. We fear what could happen to our children. And I was both touched and hurt this week. Uh, we had a cabinet meeting, and I remember talking to some of you all a while back about the Gaddises, Jason and Amy Gaddis, who Jason's the new district superintendent for the Maryville district, and their 18-year-old son was killed in a car wreck back in July. And to watch them still struggle. Great people of faith, but having a hard time. And I can't even put myself in their shoes to, to know what it's like. We have the fear of being a teenager and being left out and not fitting in. We have fears that are heightened by the confrontation in Charlottesville. We, hear, we have fears that come from the threats of North Korea. We have fears brought on by terrorist attacks that seem so random, such as driving a bus down a sidewalk. We face a lot of uncertainty in life. But it seems that uncertainty is extremely heightened in this day and time. So how do we overcome our fear? That's what I want to talk to us about today. And to focus our time together, I want you to hear two passages of Scripture. I know when I told Ashley what I was going to preach on, I only put one, but 
I'm going to add a second one. I'm going to be reading from Isaiah, the 43rd chapter, before I turn to Mark. So if you have your Bible and want to turn with me, Isaiah 43, verses 1 through 7. Hear what the prophet Isaiah says to the people of Israel. But now thus says the Lord who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt as your ransom, Ethiopia and Seba as in exchange for you, because you are precious in my sight and honored, and I love you. I give people in return for you, nations in exchange for your life. Do not fear, for I am with you. I will bring your offspring from the east and from the west. I will gather you. I will say to the north, give them up. And to the south, do not withhold. Bring my sons from far away and my daughters from the end of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. Then turn to Mark's gospel, the the fourth chapter. A very familiar story. On that day when evening had come, he said to them, let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd behind, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. Other boats were with him. A great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat, so that the boat was already being swamped. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him up, saying, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? He woke up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. Then the wind ceased, and there was dead calm. He said to them, Why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great awe and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? The word of the Lord for the people of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be be to God. God. Let us pray. Gracious God, Thank you for loving us and giving us your word to teach us. Now bless us as we share in this time in Christ's name. Amen. pastor by the name of David Lowe suggests that fear lurks just under the surface of a lot of difficult moments in our lives. And he's right. But then he asks another question. He says, is it unfaithful? Now you could surmise that that is what Jesus is hitting at in this familiar passage from Mark's gospel. They're out on the lake. Jesus is asleep. A vicious storm arises. And from trips that Sandy and I have made to Israel, we have learned that it's very easy for a storm to hit the lake there because the mountain range just sort of funnels the wind down to it. It can come up in an instant. So they're frightened. They wake Jesus up and they accuse him of not caring about them, that they're perishing. How can you sleep when we're perishing? Jesus wakes up, he calms the storm, and he says to the disciples, why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? Now, if you reverse that logic, it seems to say that faith overcomes fear, right? But we need to go a little deeper. David Lowe says, think of faith primarily as trust, not just mental cognitive assent to something, but trust that motivates you to action. For example, you only let people you trust watch your kids when they're little. And if you lose trust in your employer, you have a hard time giving all you've got to the work. Faith is trust. And he goes on to say about his own life, when I'm afraid, 
I really, really have a hard time trusting. Fear paralyzes me, making me making trusting and the confident action that trust makes possible very difficult, if not impossible. Now the passage we read from Isaiah this morning provides an interesting twist to this idea, I think. God through Isaiah very plainly says, fear not. But fear here is not meant to just muster courage. It is not meant to encourage someone to do something that might frighten them, like, you know, face that fear, Jeff, come down the ladder. One commentator has said it's meant to banish fear. And another commentator has said there's three questions we need to ask about this. What is the situation that gives rise to the fear? How will God banish fear? And why must God banish fear? What is the situation that gives rise to the fear for the people of Israel? Israel finds itself again in exile, plundered, tormented, imprisoned in some cases. Their lands and homes have been overrun. They've been shipped off to distant lands. But perhaps it's not the hands of the captors that Israel fears more than anything else, this commentator says. Perhaps what their greatest fear is is that God has allowed all this to happen to them because God has removed his hand of blessing from them as punishment for their actions. And they might even ask, could it be that God is waging a holy war against them? And if we're truthful, don't we sometimes adopt a similar attitude? Don't we sometimes think that God is out to get us when things happen to us? Now that may seem a little harsh, but it's really more than a theological question. It's more a theological question than a geographic question. And in this theological question, then God can more easily answer the fear. So we see that God will banish fear in two ways. Through redemption and by being present with people. God says, do not fear, I have redeemed you and I will be with you. Now notice Israel's given no option in the action, no role really in the action. It's all God. God will banish fear through redemption and through being present with the people. Why? It seems to say that the, the, the prophet seems to say that God has obligations to Israel. He has claimed them as his own. He has promised them a rich heritage. It shows that despite their disobedience, that has landed them in exile, God still loves them. So now let's look back at our lives. When we find ourselves in those fearful situations, how do we react? Do we well up with fear or do we face them with confidence? Maybe the key is what do you put your confidence in? What do you put your trust in? And I think that's the problem we often have the most difficulty with. We tend to look at a situation that sparks fear in our lives and we tend to think that the only way to resolve that situation is through ourselves. It's through our power. And what we often see then is our own weakness against things in life that we can't control. What we do is we forget the power and the promises and the presence that God offers us. Now we find those promises in the scriptures. Deuteronomy 31.8 says, It is the Lord who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not fail you or forsake you. Do not fear or be dismayed. Isaiah 41.10 Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be afraid, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my victorious right hand. Psalm 23, verse 4. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil. Why? For you are with me. John 14, 27. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not let them be afraid. But go back a minute to that uh, idea about how will God banish fear when he was speaking to Israel, he said he would banish fear through redemption and through being present with the people. 
So let me ask you this. How does God bring us redemption? God brings us redemption through Jesus Christ, correct? Y'all realize that, don't you? We've learned that a long time ago, haven't we? We are redeemed through the blood of Christ. It's not what I can do. It's not what you can do. It's what Christ has done for us. The angels who appeared to the shepherds when Jesus was born said, Fear not, for I behold, I bring you glad tidings of great joy. For into you is born this day a Savior. A Savior. God redeems us through Christ. But also remember that his birth, Jesus was, re, was, re, was lauded as Emmanuel, which means God is with us. So it is through Christ that God will banish our fear. Now, I do want to sound one note of warning here, and it may seem a little bit crass or funny, but hear me. God is not ADT or some other security company. Okay? We just don't put a sign up in our yard saying we're protected by God and that's all we do. We don't just sign up with God and relax because we know we're protected. That puts all the work on God. And God becomes the great bodyguard in the sky. God is with us, but we also have to stay with God. That's the thing that we often forget. That's the thing that Israel often struggled with which led them to being overrun a time and time again. They would do good, and things would be great, and they'd forget God, and you know the story. If you want God to stay with you, you have to stay with God. You have to do things in your life that, re, that renews that relationship. You have to know who God is. You have to learn to believe in God and trust in God. As I heard someone say, feed your faith and starve your fear. How do you feed your faith? Bible study, reading the word, praying, talking to God. But also there's one other thing. Recognize who is with you and build up that trust. In the story from Mark, did you catch the last line, verse 41? You know, they went through all this. Jesus has calmed the sea. He's calmed the storm. And he's rebuked them, really. And how did they respond? And they were filled with great awe and said to one another, Who then is this that even the winds and sea obey him? See, they didn't even fully then understand who Jesus was. My friends, we had the advantage of being able to look back and see who Jesus was. And to know who Jesus is. But too often we believe the lies of Satan that are weak, that we are weak, that God doesn't love us, that God is punishing us, that God is out to get us, that God has left us alone. We believe those lies more than we do God's promises. And that's why we're overcome with fear. Romans 8, 15, 16 says, For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. You've received a spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very spirit bearing witness to our spirit that we are children of God. 2 Timothy 1, 7 says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power and love and self-discipline. 1 John 4, 18 says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears does not reach perfection in love. And when I think of that verse, that verse from 1 John, maybe that's where some of us fall short and we forget. Like I mentioned, the Israelites could have easily believed, and I'm sure they did, at times that God had removed his hand of blessing from them, that God was out to get them. But despite their disobedience, God still loved them. And that's where this idea of being perfect in love comes in. Maybe it's not our love that is perfect. Maybe we're trying to get that perfect love, but maybe what we rest on is God's perfect love. And that makes the difference. Romans 8, 38 through 39 says, For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, 
nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from what? From the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now also another note of one. We have to be careful not to tr test God's love. Don't let Satan talk you into doing something or believing something just to prove or test God's love. He tried that with Jesus, remember? Be careful not to fall for that ploy. So how do we overcome fear? Through faith, but more importantly, through our faith in the one who has redeemed us. Our faith and trust in the one who is with us. Our faith and the trust and trust in the promises, the presence, and the power of God that is with us despite the fact that we are imperfect. Despite the fact that we sometimes doubt and sometimes question God. Does it mean that if we've trusted God, we won't have, face situations that strike fear in us? No. None of us are exempt from the trials of life. But as we go through those times of difficulty, where fear could reign in our lives, we need to remember that we are not alone, that God has redeemed us, and that God is with us. God loves us even when we can't see it, even when we can't feel it, even when we don't realize it. That is where our trust in God helps us overcome our fears.